In the mid to late 2000s, one of the biggest collaboration artists out there was rapper turned R&B slash reggae sensation Sean Kingston. Instantly recognizable for hits like Eeny Meeny with Justin Bieber as well as Fire Burning, Take You There and Beautiful Girls. At one point you could not turn on the radio without hearing Sean. But somewhere around 2011 he simply disappeared. What happened? What up guys, Ali here and welcome to Ali Talks Music. Add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music as well. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Now let's get into the video. Sean was born around 1990 in Miami, Florida. He was the eldest of his mother's three children. And around 1996, when he was six years old, the family relocated to Kingston, Jamaica, where they lived for three years before migrating back to the United States. A bit of a legacy himself, Sean's grandfather was the Jamaican reggae producer Lawrence Lindo, who performed as Jack Ruby. So basically, um, I've been doing music since I was seven years old. Seven, wow. Yeah, my grandfather is Jack Ruby. He's He was one of Bob Marley's producers in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, you can look him up. His name is Jack Ruby. So it's always been in my background and my family that music is, you know what I'm saying? Reggae music is, is a huge part of, you know, how I was raised up. But making music was far from Sean's mind as a youth. Ironically, since he later went into R&B, Sean's mother did not actually play teenage appropriate pop or rap while he was growing up and instead he would listen to adult music like Ice Cube and Rakim. That kinda shaped his early influences. And talk about a rough patch, by the time he was 11 years old, Sean got into some real trouble. We're talking about a breaking and entering charge, which was just the beginning of his troubled teen years. Over the next five years, he spent about 21 days in jail and even lived in a car while his mom was locked up for identity fraud. But what, what really took me to the top was when my mom got sentenced to 10 years in prison, Right. I kind of was on my own. When, and how old, how old were you, 15? I was 14. Okay. And so, what did she get caught up for? She got caught up for, she was basically doing a, you know, tax evasion, fraud, um, drug trafficking. Uh -huh. um, and I think that was it. That's not, yeah. Wow. Okay. And so, so then what happens in, to so you after that? I was by myself because I, I only been around my dad like three times, right? So I don't really have a crazy relationship with him. So when my mom left, it was like, it was I was on my own, you know? And mm. it made me, it forced me to become a man early and to get on my job. And I always said to myself that when my mom get out of jail, like, I'm gonna be picking her up in her dream car. Like, I knew in my head that, you know, 10 years is a long time for me to get this shit together. But I knew once she got out that I was going, so I started going crazy. I started hustling hard. I came to LA with $300 in my pocket. Wow. Um, yeah, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> That 300 like was only last like two days. But here's where the story takes a turn for the better. All that struggle led to a creative fire in Sean. He discovered his knack for writing catchy rhymes and hooks. He even began appearing on Miami's talent show scene and began uploading videos onto YouTube. At this point, he was performing mainly as a rapper. Eventually, a producer named Jonathan J.R. Rotem saw something special in Sean. He ended up signing him to his Beluga Heights label. And that's when the bidding wars began. My space, I started blowing up on the charts. You know, I remember they used to have the indie charts. Yeah. So my song started, like, I think two songs started taking off on the indie chart or whatever like that. And I just started hitting up people, like, you know, sending my music to them. So I hit up Timbaland. I remember hitting up Lil Jon, Pharrell. I'm hustling. I'm sending, like, 400 messages a day, like, copy and pasting messages, just being on the grind. And one day I get home and I open my, my inbox and I see J.R. Odom in my inbox. I'm like, what? Hmm. JR wrote him, he's like, yeah, you know, we got your email, you're persistent, we love it, send us some more music. So I sent them some more music, and they were like, yo, we love your sound, but, you know, we want to we want to vibe with you, but we don't know if, you know, we don't have no budget right now to fly you from Miami to LA. I'm like, no, I'm in Burbank right now, and like, I'm like, I'm in Burbank, it's perfect, like, I'm here. And like, yo, let's go. So I linked up with them, and then the rest was history. Like, wow. the first day I got there, they started singing me. They started hearing me, you know, melodies, me rapping, freestyling. And they said, yo, we want to sign you. Eventually, Epic, an imprint of Sony, snagged him up. Then around 2007, Sean dropped a song called Colors, featuring the game and Rick Ross. What's mind-blowing is that he was only 16 when this track came out. 
California, yeah. Even though Sean was spitting some fire bars, his label thought that he was more of an R&B singer. JR wrote him the producer even said in interviews that they intentionally developed Sean into a more melodic artist. So, while rap was his first love, the label began steering him more towards singing. Then around July of 2007, Sean dropped his self-titled album, Sean Kingston. This album did pretty well. It got some good reviews, charted high, and even went platinum and gold in various countries. The lead single, Beautiful Girls, was a smash. When this song came out, you couldn't go anywhere without hearing this song play. The whole concept is it's like it's an old school concept, like it's going back and forth with the 1950 and 2007s. The album also spawned other songs like Me Love, Take You There, and There's Nothing, although the last one did not really make waves. In 07 and 08, Sean began touring with big names like Gwen Stefani, Beyonce, and Kelly Clarkson. He was also featuring on hit tracks left and right like Love This and What It Is with Baby Bash. But then around 2009, Sean dropped his second album called Tomorrow and let's just say it did not get the same love. It had a relatively big single called Fire Burning which did well but the album as a whole did not. According to Sean, he felt a lot of pressure while making this album and therefore it was not the project he really wanted to put out. So yeah, while Sean proved that he could still make hits, the album did not live up to the hype. Additionally, people expected Sean to drop another Beautiful Girls and Sean had a hard time replicating that success. In his own words, he said the following. It was just a label kind of really just forcing me like, yo, 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 we gotta get another album. We gotta do this. We gotta do that. It's kind of like, I didn't want to be in a situation again where I didn't have a lot of creative control. So, despite the lukewarm success of his album, Sean was far from idle. In the same year, he lent his writing talents to Jason Derulo's debut single, What You Say, which soared to the top of the charts and went five times platinum. This time, Sean was making a mark, but he was doing it behind the scenes. But wait, there's more. He also discovered an R&B singer called Ayaz and signed him to JR's label. He was not just focused on himself. He was giving other musicians a shot too. And for his own work, he dropped a mixtape called My Time. Fast forward to around 2010, even without dropping a lot of his own singles, Sean was making waves. He jumped on tracks with big names like Bow Wow's For My Hood and Justin Bieber's platinum single, Eeny Meeny. You can make up your mind, 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 mind. Oh, and let's not forget his platinum collaboration with Nicki Minaj called Letting Go. You, Mr. Kingstein. On his own, he gave us songs like Dumb Love, Party All Night, plus another mixtape called Tomorrow. Now all of these songs were supposed to be part of his third album, featuring an all-star lineup from T-Pain to Kanye West. But guess what? Sean decided to scrap it and start fresh. He was even set to drop a mixtape with Justin Bieber called Our World, but that got shelved too. However, he did go on tour with Justin and dropped a new mixtape around 2011 called King of Kings. Up until now, Sean's career was, you could say, on an upward trend. But then comes around 2011 and things take a harrowing turn. Around May, Sean was jet skiing in Miami at about 35 miles per hour when disaster struck. He lost control and slammed into the Palm Island Bridge. Now we're talking life-threatening injuries here. A broken jaw, fractured wrist, water in his lungs, and a torn aorta. The impact was so intense that imprints of his body were actually etched into the side of the bridge. Initially, he was in very critical condition but stabilized about three days later. 
However, a couple of days after that, he was back in surgery, this time for an emergency open heart operation because of that torn aorta, a condition that 90% of people did not survive. Thankfully, he pulled through. After crashing his jet ski into a bridge over the holiday weekend, Kingston and his female passenger both ended up in the water. We don't know if it was a direct hit or if it was a glancing blow. They did collide with the bridge and they ended up in the water. So yeah, Sean had hit the peak and then plummeted into a valley. In Sean's own words, he said, I'm not gonna lie, it held me back. Before the accident, I was on fire. And when it happened, I just fell back. Recovery mode had me out of the game for at least a year. Shortly after his accident, a very bizarre thing happened. Fake screenshots began circulating online that claimed that Sean had actually died in the accident. These went viral and created what's known as the Mandela Effect where a bunch of people share a false memory. About a year post-accident and about 45 pounds lighter, he announced album number 3 called Back to Life and threw in a very fun challenge. $100 to anyone who could guess the inspiration behind the title. It is boy Sean Kingston. Time is money in to you about to turn up. Vegas is summertime, man. Gotta perform at a Palm Spring party. Back to Life album, man. Get ready, we turned up. Chip. New album coming out in stores. It's gonna be platinum the first week. <laughs> Support it. Back to Life, yeah, September 10th. We in the van right now, car service by the head of Vegas, you know what I'm saying? Got my dog right here, Chase Bricks. In the building. He up next, Time is Money. DJ Twin back here. Yeah, yeah. Time is Money. Got my dog, L Dub, right here, man. You know we rocking now. Turn up, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. L. Reed, you know what I mean? Got my other, last but not least, my barber. You see me looking fresh with my hair, cause you know what I mean? Hundred dollar lineups, you know who to holler at. Not playing oh, games. We ain't playing games, but my barber got millions. The album kicked off with singles like Back to Life, featuring T.I. and Rum and Ray Bands, featuring Sher Lloyd. Let's just say that these songs were not hits in the U.S. Come April of 2013, Sean dropped Beat It with Chris Brown and Wiz Khalifa, which did fairly well. But when his album Back to Life finally dropped, let's just say it was a huge flop. But hang on, there's more. Just one month before the album dropped, Sean got slapped with a lawsuit by one Carissa Capiloto. She claimed that back in 2010, while Sean was on tour with Justin Bieber, he assaulted her in a hotel room. The story was messy with conflicting accounts and medical reports. Criminal charges were raised around 2010, but were later dropped due to inconsistencies in her story. Sean insisted it was consensual, but Carissa was suing for about $5 million. So yeah, Sean's comeback was pretty strange. It was also clouded by a pretty serious legal issue. So by late 2012, Sean's album had tanked and he had legal woes. By the end of August, Sean decided to settle the sexual assault case out of court, reportedly for much less than the initial $5 million claim. Why? He had an album and a tour to promote. But even after settling, a few university shows got cancelled and there was a petition to remove him from headlining events. It barely got any traction, but this was a major blow to his career. Fast forward to around 2013 and Sean's career was basically at a standstill. And get this, now he starts making headlines, but not for his music. Instead, it's for jewelry and unpaid bills. Around June of 2013, Sean got a Rolex watch, put down $10,000 up front, and wrote a check for the remaining $36,000. But guess what? The check bounced. He made some partial payments but then ghosted the company, leaving an outstanding balance of over $21,000 and they didn't sue him until about 4 years later. Then around 2014, a New York jeweler named Avi Day slapped Sean with a million dollar lawsuit. We're talking unpaid bills for watches, chains, and other bling dating back to around 2008. Everything Sean owed added up to about $226,000 plus punitive damages. So to sum it up, in the span of a few years, Sean went from a promising young artist to a guy drowning in controversy and debt. 
So in 2015, Sean lands in hot water once again, this time with a different jeweler, Avion Jewelers. He claims he had been briefly kidnapped by them. Why? Well, Sean says he bought a watch for $225,000, paid a deposit of $185,000, but did not pay the rest. The two sides then met up in a downtown LA parking lot at almost 2 a.m. Nothing shady about that, right? Sean returns the watch, but is not happy when they did not give him a cheaper one. An argument ensues, and Sean ends up briefly kidnapped. According to Sean, the jeweler took the watch, locked him in a car at gunpoint, and drove off, eventually dumping him in the street. Now, after all of this, Sean took to Twitter to air out his grievances. He said the following, Never trust Avian jewelers, period. Shady business. God never misses anything, so we will leave this in his hands. But just know, karma. He also went on to say, Love all the fans. I'm okay and safe. Just hurt to work so hard for something and have someone thinking they can't just take it from you. Shaking my head. Then by around 2015, Sean was trying to shift his gears back into music. He had bills to pay and a bunch of lawsuits to fend off. He hopped on Mafia Clowns' I Wanna Love Ya, but it was only a minor hit in Germany. Baby, your love is a murder, it's a one-day devil, it's killing me, and it's taking me to heaven. Then around 2016, he dropped two singles, Thank Me, and All I Got. But then the music train derails once again around 2018 with, you guessed it, another lawsuit. This time, Sean owed another jeweler, and they go by the name Haymov Jewelers. They claim Sean owed them for a Rolex and a $19,000 bracelet. They go to court, a judge orders Sean to pay $44,000, and he doesn't. And now there's a warrant out for his arrest. The tab eventually balloons to over $314,000. Sean claims ignorance, saying he thought the court papers were about another case. The jewelers then say they never heard from him. But wait, there is more. By 2017, word on the street was that Sean Kingston was broke. Oh, and, you know, a lot of people say that they say I own jewelry and I'll be paying people. But you know, that's all rumors because at the end of the day, if I was broke, I wouldn't be spending, you know, $25,000 a month out here living in LA. At this point, he was not just dodging jewelry bills, he was also not paying for cars. After renting an Escalade and an S-Class Mercedes, another check bounced. Now it seems like Sean Kingston did not learn his lesson because around 2018, he was involved in another lawsuit. But hold on, Sean was not done collecting lawsuits. Later in the year, his limo driver sued him and the Migos over a brawl in Las Vegas. The driver claims he was injured and feared for his life. Now, according to reports, Sean Kingston was jumped by the Migos because the Migos had a minor beef with Soulja Boy. At the time, Sean Kingston was in a building and the Migos called him. They were like, yo, come outside. Let's talk. And when Sean Kingston walked outside, they jumped him immediately without saying a word. According to Sean Kingston, the reason he was jumped was because he was very good friends with Soulja Boy. Now, after this, Sean was still getting into more trouble. He ordered more jewelry and could not pay for it. Now, despite the legal mess, Sean always kept trying to revive his career. He dropped some singles, announces albums that never come out, and even talks about starting a professional rapper boxing league. And to be honest with you, I ain't been really like, I just been really focused on the album, recording music. Um, I've been writing a lot of music behind the scenes for a lot of big artists. Mm. So I mean, that's, what I, that's where most of my time, you know, running my label time is money and all that type of stuff. So when it came to the interview side, I ain't really want to do much of it because I, I didn't feel like it was time. Which never materialized. His fourth album, Road to Deliverance, came out and it was a big flop. It did not even chart. Then around 2022, Sean Kingston was in more headlines, this time involving jewelry once again. He was sued over two watches, amounting to over $900,000, and of course, Sean does not pay. I think at this point, Sean needs to stop buying jewelry. I mean, he sounds like a guy who never learns from his mistakes. 
Now, even with all this drama, Sean was not done. He recently dropped a new single called How We Chop and has about 12.3 million listeners on Spotify. His most listened to songs are Beautiful Girls, Eeny Meeny, Fire Burning, and Take You There. That's a good question. I basically choose to take a break. You know, I was, mm. in, I was in some bad contracts. Um, see a lot of this this is a lot of times that people don't really they don't really hear this side, you know what I'm saying? Like people just try to cover this side up. But in all reality, the, the downside of the music industry is like it's political, you know, and mm. I had some bad deals that I had signed when I was younger, so I couldn't really put out I could, but it wasn't I, I wasn't excited, I wasn't happy in the situation that I was in. That's it for me, it's your boy Ali. What happened to Sean Kingston in your opinion? Let me know down below. Also add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music. Till next time, peace.